All right, everybody. Today we have Dr. Gary Schwartz. Um, he's double board certified in anesthesia and pain management. He is also the um, director of acute pain management at uh, AABP Integrative Pain Care and Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn. Um, he's currently seeing patients in Brooklyn and Great Neck. Uh, we are happy to have him. Um, the purpose of this video is to inform patients that are in chronic pain, um, how, to, how can they manage their symptoms and pain during this lockdown crisis. Well, thank you for having me, Michael. I appreciate it. I hope you and your family are doing well. Thank you. Um, same to you. So are you currently seeing patients? So we're mainly integrated most of our practice to telehealth, but we are still seeing patients in the office for emergencies. If people need an acute injection, an acute radiculopathy, acute herniation, any new severe pain problem to keep them out of the emergency room. Because my fellows on the front line in the ER do not want people in the ER if they don't need to be. And also patients are scared to go. No one wants to suffer now. It's interesting. Are you, so are some of your colleagues being redeployed into these hospitals to treat some of these patients? Yeah, so some of my colleagues in different institutions, I don't want to name them, the, right. they're, they're surgeons, they're orthopedic surgeons, neurosurgeons, PM&R docs, all being redeployed to ICUs and staffing med floors because it's all hands on deck now. Like me personally, I'm even working in the hospital tomorrow. Today I'm in the office. I've been doing telehealth all morning with you. I had one emergency who came into the office, and tomorrow I'm in the hospital working in anesthesia and doing airways to help out the patients. So let's get into it. What are you telling patients, your current patients that have been seeing you? I mean, typically, how often do your patients come in? So most of my patients, uh, if they're, most of my practice is interventional pain with different injections. So most of those patients come in every year, every six months, every few months. Then I have some people on medical marijuana. They come in yearly. And I have some people on some chronic pain medication, a lot of cancer patients on chronic medication. They normally come in monthly. So what I tell my patients now is if they want to see me, the first thing I have my staff ask, or I'll ask them, do you need to come in, or could we implement a telehealth video visit like we're talking now? Mm -hmm. Will that suffice? If it's for their usual mandatory monthly visit or refill, I'll see them over video. A lot of my patients are elderly. Why bring them out for no reason when we have this technology? As long as they have a smartphone, a computer, most people are pretty adept with technology now. So, Yeah. So what would make you want to see a patient versus doing it through tele? So if I see them on telehealth, um, like recently I had a patient, she could not turn her neck, right? Literally, literally could not turn her neck. She was in severe pain. Her daughter came in and take her and was helping take care of her. She can't even dress herself. Her neck pain is so bad. Wow. So for her, it was during the weekend. I said, you know, try heat. You have a muscle relax in a home, anti-inflammatories, Tylenol. If that's not good enough, come see me Monday. If it's severe enough where you want to go to the ER, I told her to come to me first to see what I could do just to keep her out of the ER. There's no reason for an elderly patient, especially in the hospitals in Brooklyn, even Long Island, they're swarmed with these COVID-19 patients yep. to be there for no reason. So anything I could do to take the pressure off my frontline colleagues is what I'm trying to do. Got it. Hold on yep. a sec. Yep. Yeah, because I mean, you know, uh, you go into a hospital oh, with a stick sorry. neck. Yep. I have to mute this phone. I have to <laughs> no worries. So, obviously, if you're doing a televisit and the phone rings, you actually have to pick up, right? <laughs> I do. I told them I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm busy. I, I told the staff, it's probably my staff, to make me sign a chart, which we'll catch up to later. Yeah. And we have multiple desks back here, but now we're practicing social distancing, so we're working in different locations to yeah. keep it safe. So I know that Medicare um, is pushing a lot of um, telephone calls. They're calling them uh, e-visits. Are you doing those as well? So I prefer to see my patients on the video. For some of my patients who do not have a smartphone or a computer with a front-facing or rear-facing camera or even a tablet, um, then I will do the phone visits. But I still think there is something to seeing a person, making sure they look okay. The actual, the video and audio, I think, is an important component. Because you see your patients, like let's say even yourself in your practice, you see some of them 
a few times a week. You could see if they're feeling under the weather, if something seems off, if they're taking their medications mm-hmm. not appropriately. And during this time where we are not able to see our families all the time, or our friends, especially for my elderly patients who can't get out, I think the access of a face is important. So are you taking vitals? Like, how are you going through the whole, you know, blood pressure, vitals? and So the blood pressures, I'm not happy. You yeah. can't take the blood pressures now, obviously. Yeah. Um, if people have like an Apple Watch or some sort of smart watch, I'll ask them to take their pulse. They could have that easily, easily enough. Yeah, yep, yep. It's great with technology. I have a few patients um, who have their own home oxygen monitors. So I've had them record that. Yeah. But otherwise, you know, you could have a patient feel their own pulse. If they could feel their pulse, their blood pressure is probably okay. And it's a new frontier in the technology and how we're using it. So we go by feel. Like, our blood pressure varies throughout the day. If they go to your office or my office and they take a blood pressure, that's just a small sample size. You know, it really is amazing. I mean, even with my staff, I feel like we've been pushed into this telehealth, you know, medicine practice. And I think it's going to be there even, you know, once this ends. I mean, imagine you seeing fewer patients in the office because, you know, a lot of your visits can now just be through, through, uh, through, Telehealth. I mean, hold just on one second. Able- yep. Hold on. Sorry. You're good. No problem. A lot of these. You're up to a lot of these visits. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, I'm even wondering, even for your practice, being able to monitor some of these patients in their house is probably yeah. You know, that would be a game changer for you. You know. Well, I think it might be useful. It might open up some new doors, and there's different technological companies looking at this. Instead of maybe like following a patient once a month because they can't get out, maybe you'll see them every two weeks. You could see there is, you might have a better assessment to their medications or how they're doing after their procedure instead of just a yeah. phone call and checking in. I know. It's incredible. But like, it, like everything else, it's all about the red tape and how the government allows uh, each people to use this technology. Even yeah. for your practice, you might even have, let's say, the certain insurances or even CMS allows a certain amount of visits to a physical therapy office. Right? They might be able to expand that and allow video conferencing so you could watch them do their exercise at home. So you could see more people acutely in the office and maybe have a side visit with someone. Hey, are these stretches right? Or am I doing these morning exercises to help them maybe even prevent them coming from me or going to an ER or avoid surgery? Correct. And I think obviously decreasing cost is, you know, the insurance's number one mission behind this. Um, I know that, you know, with, you know, with us as providers, I think the the, uh, the payment model I think is not as not as you know beneficial as seeing them in the office. So hopefully, providers aren't making decisions to not do telehealth because of that. You know, Actually, uh, I, hope, I hope everyone wants to do it in the best interest of the patient. Exactly. No. Exactly. Prior to this pandemic, though, we could not utilize telehealth really in our areas so much because you had to be in rural areas to access it. Yep. Yep. So yeah, even though New York State was a parity state, no insurance really really covered it. I mean, I think it was only up until a few weeks ago, you know, for at least physical therapy um, that really allowed us to perform telehealth. I just want to go back. So you are performing injections still in the office for, for yes. patients that, that for that asymptomatic do. patients with informed consent. Obviously, there's risk. We try to minimize steroids during this time because it does have a small, slight risk of uh, immunosuppression, which we want to try to avoid. But for, yeah. the, for the patients that are in such severe pain where it's really functioning their daily life, their daily activities, mm-hmm. or contemplating going to an emergency room, definitely. Here's a question. I think it's been in the, the media. NSAIDs with coronavirus. I know that there was some correlation. But it's a great that. topic. So there, was, there was one yeah. one case report that showed there was some correlation between worsening symptoms because unfortunately a lot of these corona, COVID-19 patients, if they do get intubated, they get kidney liver failure and can go down that history. Right. So there was a case report of a few patients. They were suggesting that they might have gotten worse. Uh, there was a recent statement by some pain societies, including ASRA, and there was a whole big teleconference last week that if people are on NSAIDs, they should continue them, but just be wary to monitor signs for fever. Most people have a thermometer at home. Yep. Because it, it is a good pain medication. That's you know, amazing. you don't want to be starting 
a potentially a new opiate during this time when it's a respiratory disease out there it could be respiratory depression people have other side effects so I, I i telling my patients now that it was a single case report from italy it seems like people have went the other way now the societies that i'm a part of recommend continuing the NSAIDs just with caution Got so it. if you have a low-grade fever let's say 99.5 and you took a thousand milligrams of tylenol and a couple of those the NSAIDs before Maybe you have to monitor that more closely. You actually might have a fever. But yes, if it's helping yeah. you with your pain, preventing you from going to the ER, getting you outside and moving, and any type of movement is good. You know, you don't have to go out and run a marathon, ride a bike. You could do Tai Chi in your yard, just some light stretching. The vitamin D is good. Any sort of movement releases the endorphins, and that helps decrease your pain, as you know. Yeah, so it seems like we're, uh, the general rule of thumb is to keep telling patients Stick with they've been, you know, with what they've been doing. Don't try anything new. Um, I guess if they have a flare up, that's when they, you know, can see you, and then yes. you can recommend, you know, how to deal with that flare up. And we have different treatments, different modalities to treat with that flare up. Uh, obviously, it's an uncertain time. The information we get, the news gets, is changing on a daily basis. So we, yeah. no one knows when this is going to end. When we could start having our practices back to normal. The only thing we do know now is we want to keep our patients comfortable. We want to keep people as active as possible. Yeah. And we kind of want to offload the emergency rooms and urgent cares because we don't want to ex expose those patients going there. And the doctors, nurses, physical therapists, physicians, assistants, everyone working in the ER does not need an extra patient right now. Yeah. So let's um, talk about your uh, medical marijuana practice. I guess, how did you start that? I know it's a huge hot topic now. Um, so I guess just kind of go over it, um, if you don't mind. So for years, people have been discussing as marijuana, whether inhaled, oils, mm -hmm. in food, as a way of treating pain, anxiety, all different ailments. It can go way back centuries. You could look at people. I mean, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of CBD. I mean, you know, I see some, you know, um, grocery stores you know, advertising so, it. So I mean, there's, yeah. there's a lot of And the scary thing this. about that is that everyone thinks that's FDA approved. It's not. So yeah. I got into the medical marijuana in New York once they allowed it because I heard research at pain conferences. California started 10 years before. Now I think 34 states have it either legally recreational or medis medicinal. Look, the research shows it helps. We obviously need more research on it because it's a schedule one substance in the United States. And for your viewers, from the federal government's perspective, that means it has no medical benefits. But 34 of the 50 states say that it does which is a little confusing. We're doing more research. So I got involved when New York State first started a few years ago, mm -hmm. just as an avenue to assist my patients who don't want opiates, who didn't respond to injections, who did not want injections, or are suffering from cancer and nothing else was helping. So I'm always looking for new treatments, new different medications, different ways to help these people. That's how I got involved once in New York State. So are you prescribing it now, currently during... Uh this epidemic? Yes. yes. For my patients. So I've not had a new patient come in just for this currently in the past month. Uh, all my patients that I have on it, which is a decent amount, I've had a couple come in for their refills. I normally write their prescription for six months to a year. We change the ratios based on how they're doing. I let them discuss with the pharmacist at these dispensaries. And there's different dispensaries in each county in New York that has them just because these medications are not covered by insurance. So it's cash out of a patient's pocket. Wow. So, so Medicare is not covering it. Medicare and no insurance currently covers these medications because okay. as I said before, it's still marijuana, specifically THC in the marijuana, is considered a Schedule One substance, which means it's illegal. Got so it. Medicare is obviously not covering it right now. Of course, but it's, it's and, federal. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. And all the commercial plans, though, most of the commercial plans that we would deal with, uh, the Blue Crosses, the United, they don't cover it either because they supplement Medicare Advantage plans. Yep. And they get reimbursed by the government. So no one's jumping into this boat. So with just, billions of dollars at stake. Yeah. So just for our patients, what is a typical patient that would benefit from it? Like what would make you go towards medical marijuana over something else? So I talk to the patient, I examine them, I see what their problem is. So I have two sets of subsets, well, three subsets of patients that I come in my office. One cancer pain. So for the cancer pain patients, I offer to them right off the bat because it might help with nausea and anxiety, everything from their chemo and radiation. And that's, and that's been traditionally what it's been used for is that. I mean, First line. Yeah. And then I have people who have come to me, they have an acute disc herniation, and I'm the first doctor they're seeing and worked up. 
then that's not the first option I go to. Or I have other people that they're seeing me as a third, fourth opinion that have tried multiple treatments. So then I might offer to them in conjunction with other things and mm-hmm. says different type of interventional therapies, injections, spinal cord stimulators, epidurals. Have so you, you can use more than one modality at a time. Yeah. Have you ever weaned off a patient um, who was on opiates just on medical marijuana? Like, have you used that to kind of get people I've done a few of people. I, I, had a, I had a couple of cancer patients who were having side effects from the opiates, and they asked to try it, and I've weaned them off. And I've had a handful of other patients who, in conjunction with the weaning of the opiates, so they've come to me to help them wean off, and I add that to their regimen. Is it a miracle drug? You're not going to have a couple of tinctures of marijuana and start doing backflips down the street. Pain's a yeah. complex problem. It's, the, it's you know, pain is subjective. If yeah. I say, "How are you feeling?" Say, if you have anxiety with the COVID nineteen, or worried about your business, or worried about your family members, it might raise your pain level. So I tell them it's part of the solution to their pain problem. But people have you had patients? Open. Sorry. I'll go finish. Um, have you had patients come in specifically requesting that? Over the past year, I've had more people requesting it specifically. I think uh, as the national news media, the Surgeon General, and more people discuss the opiate crisis, mm-hmm. the opiate ep- epidemic in the country, you know, 20 years ago, if you hurt your ankle, you hurt your knee, you expected to go to your doctor and maybe get a hydrocodone or towel number three or Percocet. The thought process has changed. So people want to stay away from those drugs now. And people are looking for more natural, holistic alternatives, which marijuana was. You know, people might be used to it from trying it in college or high school or some other avenue, yep. and they find it maybe a safe, safer alternative. Got it. New York, so, though, just so you know, it's not allowed smoking. They have vaping oils, pills. Other states like California, Colorado, wow. and Chicago do allow smoking. Or I should say Illinois, it's not Chicago, but I just visited there. Wow, completely had no idea. So, because um, that was my next question, the forms, are they different? Like for someone to have, I guess, to ingest it versus vaping, is there any any correlation between what's better for pain for different, well, different diagnoses? It's different onsets and duration. So let's say if, you, if, if you've seen someone smoke marijuana, let's say at a, a fish concert or a Dave Matthews concert or yeah. whatever your fancy the onset of smoking marijuana might be 5, 10, 15 minutes. It lasts for about two to four hours. Vaporization is similar. And by vaporization, if people, um, it's like a small little device, almost like it's vaping pretty much. But for marijuana, that's about the same as smoking. The biggest risk of that is the vaping-associated lung disease. If you have oral mucosa, like a little tab in your mouth, yeah, that's onset. It takes a little bit longer to start working, fifteen to forty-five minutes, but it lasts six to eight hours. Wow! And if you ingest it orally, it takes about an hour to two, three hours to kick in, but it lasts six to twelve hours. So some of my chronic pain patients prefer a combination. So if you have like chronic cancer pain, you would might want the oral, the submucosal, because it lasts for a longer period of the day. You might be able to take it twice a day, and then have a vaporization for an acute attack. The interesting thing with marijuana, and when we talk marijuana, there's hundreds of cabinoids and phytocabinoids and THC. The most common ones we're talking about, THC and CBD, are like the Delta 9 THC and just plain CBD. And that's, we're learning about all these different things. But it's really interesting in that THC affects each area of the body differently, depending if you're taking a low dose or a high dose. And it's probably um, the form as well, right? So I, I know there's... There's um, CBD oil that some of our patients have, right? For you know, chronic knee pain, arthritis. Um, are you dealing with those creams as well? So we use those. Those mostly you can pick up at like your local store. That the dispensaries don't normally have those creams. That's like not what the certificate is needed for. A plain CBD cream you could pick up on Amazon if you really want to. And when are I those tell my effective? patients, like, are those effective? So any cream, I tell my patients too. It's always worth trying it. Because again, pain is subjective. It's only money, I guess, right? What do I tell you? If, if, if it's financially available for you, like if, it, if, it's, if it's between the cream and like your rent or food, pay the rent or food. But all these creams help because I, I do find the human touch helping with pain. Like any type of cream you have, you have to rub that area, which yeah. if you start rubbing your knee now, if it's irritating, it probably will feel a little better if you rub it. What do most people do? If you injure your knee, your knee wakes up stiff in the morning, you rub it. So you're putting a substance that has known anti-inflammatory properties on there 
plus your own hand, which is warming up. So I find that helps for people. But again, with pain, nothing is 100%. Got it. And I guess finding um, dispensaries, is that challenging for, for Not patients? really. So the biggest issue if you don't have access to a car, but I know there's dispensaries in Queens, Nassau, Manhattan, there's definitely a few. They just opened two in Suffolk County on 110. So they're, they're <laughs> it's pretty accessible. The biggest thing I tell my patients, just call before, because it's not like a regular pharmacy. You can't just walk in. Sometimes you have to go by appointment. Yeah. Because they're obviously careful. And just not with the insurance. You also, if you're going to those dispensaries, you have to have an approved New York State marijuana card, which you could go from a licensed physician. If you look up the state website, obviously I'm one of them, but there's plenty of other people as well. If you go to the New York State H HSC website, I think it's NewYorkStateHSC.gov, but I'll get you in one second. Yeah, we will. Um, we can attach any of these uh, websites or literature um, to the end. Much, of the if you go to the Commerce at the Health State of New York and register there, they will have a list of practitioners. Because I don't expect someone from like Rochester or Buffalo to come down to Long Island. That's a little bit ridiculous. There's probably someone. So, that could you do televisits for medical marijuana? Like, do you see an application for that? You know, in the future, I see it more utilized for a follow-up visit. I still think the first visit, an initial visit, during this time it's different. We can't get out. It may be useful for people like in nursing homes or bed bound, mm -hmm. but I think that will be the exception, not the rule. For follow-ups, yes, and for the renewal of their subscription. Let's say I saw you in the office today and we weren't on telehealth, or I saw you six months ago. Yeah. And now I see you and be like, oh, the symptoms are the same. Yes. How is it helping? Oh, the CBD-THC ratio in a 50-50 split by oral view has decreased my pain 70%. I'm very happy with it. Then I can see continuing the therapy. But a first visit, though, I'd still like to see the patient because we can do certain tests. As you know, you do physical therapy exercises, but there's something about examining the patient yourself to make sure you're not missing anything in the diagno diagnosis. Well, I also think liability-wise for any physician to you know, be prescribing medication without as a first time use, you have to see that. It's going to be very difficult. Yeah. That's why I don't think the telehealth is going to be widespread for everyone because you could miss something. Let's say you're showing me from the waist up right now, you could have a big ulcer or wound sitting in your leg that I can't even see. Unless it's you to make me show you my you know, entire body. I have, I have some new yeah. patients. Yeah. I had a patient who broke their foot. They got sent to me for a CRPS referral. So I had them like, it's and I had to show them like I took, my computer, and I'm like, look, show me your foot. Could you tap your foot like Love this? Love the socks. Wow, look at them. Wow. Yeah. I have some bright socks, but it's <laughs> difficult for most people to use. If you're in chronic pain and you're on a laptop like myself, and look, I have a new laptop. It's lightweight. If you have a laptop from 10 years ago and you're 85 years old with a bad shoulder, it's going to be hard to pick up your laptop and rotate it to show your feet. You know, I, I think even, you know, physical therapy, what we're doing is we have a lot of um, – physical therapy techs in the offices. So who actually are demonstrating the, uh, the techniques on somebody else through a video camera. So I agree. I think, you know, obviously it's going to be limited, but the question is for rural places like Rochester, would you accept a patient, you know, via, you know, a telehealth from- I would accept one of the, like, let's say Rochester is still a big city. If it, if it was somewhere they could not find a doctor by them, I would see them in this pension in emergency now to help someone out, but then I would recommend them to one of my colleagues up there because as we were both discussing, there's something to see someone in patient, get a full yeah. physical exam for your, you and your team to show them the exact stretches and exercise to do properly. It's very yeah. difficult to do something by yourself. That's why, that's why you're there. It's so funny. So in the physical therapy profession, they're actually pushing us to do evaluations at a state. You know, it's unbelievable. But I guess you know, liability wise for a PT is going to be a lot different than prescribing someone medicine. You yeah. Know? And I think there, look for small hospital systems in small towns, they can get an expert like you and your team in there and probably as a cheaper alternative. That's what, unfortunately the, the, the cost as you brought up in the beginning is uh, making some of these decisions. Yeah. Yeah. So I think telehealth is better than nothing. Don't get me wrong. It's so, definitely better than nothing. Yeah. So this video is going to go out to, um, you know, our database of, of patients. So if there's a patient that's home now that wants to be seen, a new patient, 
could they call your office and would they can you see call them? my office? Uh, I have a Long Island number 516-482-7246, which spells out pain. My Brooklyn 718-436-7246. Or if people really need uh, assistance, they could email me. I could write it back to you, which is G Schwartz at AABCorp.com. They could email me directly. They could find me on social media. Shockingly on Twitter, I've gotten a few patients over the years because I'm engaged with other doctors and we discuss different literature and some people have reached out through there and that's at Gary Schwartz MD. Very, uh, very plain name. So I guess it, you know, so the moral is if a patient's, you know, in pain during this crisis, you can see them, you will help them. Um, and I think once this is over, I think medical marijuana is a great, um, a great thing for them to try if they've tried, you know, if they've uh, tried other applications, how many doctors, are using this? Is this a common practice? Yeah, there's a few hundred in New York, which is a, still a minor, a minor port of the doctors and nurse practitioners and PAs in the state. But it helps patients, though. And I can't stress enough, though. One of the most important things with people with pain is they have to move. I'd say 95% of my patients have to go to physical therapy after the treatment because. I don't structurally fix a lot of people. There's a few procedures I do that structurally fix people. The majority of my procedures, I'm decreasing the inflammation around the nerve, around the joint, helping out with spasm, but they have to correct their previous and mechanical issues to get back to their normal life. Whether it's their core being weak, their glutes being weak, whether they have joint disease in their back and have to strengthen stuff, or you have arthritis in your knees and you have to strengthen your yep. quadriceps and hamstrings you guys play such an important role to get people back to their normal lives. I'm only a portion of it. It's a team-based approach and I can't stress that enough. And I tell I think, it to all my patients. You know, and, and I think that's why, you know, um, our practice and yours, we have such a good connection back and forth. I think, you know, there's so many patients out there that are just looking for a quick fix. And I think they don't, they don't ever get, uh, yeah, get to physical therapy. And I think having a physician that, really believes in therapy so much, I think it's ultimately going to be in you know, uh, the best interest for the patient. Um, like a perfect example, I tell all my patients all the time, they come, they want an epidural, fine. We'll get you out of pain right now. Wait, let's so see you have to they're, they're coming in asking for an epidural. I've had people come in like first, like, oh, my doctor told me to get an epidural or my friend told me I have a disc herniation, I should get an epidural. I'm like, have you tried physical therapy? Have you tried NSAIDs? Like, you know, if you can't walk, we'll do it. Don't get me wrong. But like, if you've had this pain for like two months, there's no way your core is strong enough. You have to work on your gait imbalances. It's, not it's, just, re it's just really treating the symptom and not the problem, right? So yeah, that, and that's what a lot of people want. It's like the same thing as the diet industry. Everyone's looking for like a quick shake to take during the day, a quick pill. Not, okay, I'm going to eat vegetables with each meal, drink water, stop drinking sugar. But that's what you have to do to keep a healthy weight. You have to go to physical therapy to fix your imbalances for your mechanical insecurities. But I, I feel like for an acute, acute injury, does um, an epidural, you know, is it warranted to prescribe an epidural as like a first line of defense? Yeah, if someone comes in with an acute disc herniation like, or like a lumbar radicular or sciatic pain shooting down the leg, of course. Mm -hmm. And I'll do that then to get them out of the pain, to get them moving. But then they have to go back to physical therapy because something caused it. Most people don't just have an acute disc herniation. They don't just pick up 400 pounds in the ground. And if they did, they probably had some muscular imbalances or some other issues which allowed them to have that mm, acute herniation. There's always stuff to work on. And I also feel like, too, you know, there are a lot of physicians that don't prescribe physical therapy, I think, because, you know, so many PTs sometimes are flaring up some of their symptoms. So I think it's very important to have that connection with a good physical therapist who's in line with really reading the patient. It's a lot of times them coming to therapy is just doing a, you know aquatic therapy in a heated pool and that's it. You know, yeah, there's just so many pools a, a walking they got, back and forth. Yeah, they get on a bike, they get a heating pad. I don't want to go back, or they stretch me out too much. I'm like, I'm like, it's not a one size. It's not like McDonald's approach. You're just getting a cheeseburger, or a hamburger. It's like yeah. you have to work with your therapist and say, okay, once you go this much, this is all I can go. And I'm like, it's a two way conversation. You work together. Look, some people probably do great in therapy and they start feeling better in a, in like two, three weeks. Most Some people correct. have to go yep. through yep. months of therapy to correct their imbalances. We all have our own issues. But they're not going to, they're not going to be seeing you if they were getting better in, uh, in two to three weeks, right? Usually people see you 
if they're not, if, you know, if they've had pain, right? For more yeah, they normally weeks. come back, but some people come back with a different issue. Be like, oh, yeah. hey, thanks a lot. My back's feeling better. Mike's fabulous. Him and his team are great. My back's feeling better. Hey, just, you know, is there anything you could do? I've had this lingering shoulder problem or knee problem or yeah. elbow. People always come up with different issues. It's like the old adage, like, oh, my leg hurts. So you punch them in the arm. So you don't complain about your leg anymore. You fix one problem. That's the importance of physical therapy right there. People just don't have an, if your back hurts, you probably have other issues. You might have a gait imbalance that's causing it. So then your knee might hurt or your hip in addition to it. There's a lot of times I fix the acute problem, but then other issues will flare up that have been there before, just not as serious. Yeah, I know. Um, so I guess, is there anything else? Um, we want to tell patients. Um, well, number one, that we're, we're here to help. I think both of our teams are here to help them um, be safe during this time. Obviously, wash your hands for 20 seconds. They say uh, the chorus of your favorite song, just hum it along. John Denver's uh, West Virginia seems to be yeah. good one. It's easy to remember. But otherwise, we're here to help you uh, keep on moving as the weather gets nicer in New York or to other parts of the area where you send out to. Try to get outside a little bit, even for basic exercises. If you're in pain, even light stretches could work out. If you can't get to the office or see either of us right now, there's free videos of Tai Chi online you could do, which is low impact. The most important thing is to try to keep moving and obviously stay in touch with your friends and families via uh, video chats like this, phone calls, because I, I do think social interaction is important. Yeah, I mean, I think there's uh, another process we would even um, you know uh, speak about, but I think um, depression leads to pain as well. Oh yeah. Right. So if, if someone has chronic pain that they have to, you know, depression, they're not, you know, they're not moving. They're not, you know, going outside. They're, you know, depressed because they, you know, they, they can't see their friends. I think that's a whole other aspect of pain. I think social distancing is a bad term. It should be physical distancing. Correct. Like yeah. you can still be social like this. You can still see yeah. people. You can still yeah. talk to people like, pick up the phone, call someone. I think that's important during this time. Mm -hmm. Like we talked before, anxiety, depression could make pain worse. Seriously, I know, I know. Don't sit around in bed all day. That's not good for your back, your knees, your hips, arthritis. That's the worst thing people could do. And it's so nice out. It's about, you know, 65 uh, degrees out right now in New York, so. I gotta get outside soon when I'm done uh, with my telehealth visits for the day. Yeah. Um, all right, Dr. Schwartz, thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's uh, been a pleasure. We will. Um, email this video out along with um, all of uh, the links and information that um, you send us. Um, awesome. I'll send you all that stuff. Uh, I want everyone to be safe. Take care of yourselves, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in the offices soon. All right. Take care. Thanks, Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, Mike.